My name is Anne Lord and it's a great to be here for another AWRI webinar. Today's session discusses options and considerations for dealing with unharvested fruit in smoke affected vineyards. I would like quickly to provide some tips for anyone new to AWRI webinars. Question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question into the text box and click to send. If you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the, AW, at the underscore AWRI. Also, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to view from the AWRI's YouTube channel. All registrants will, be, will receive a link to view the recording after the session. Questions and considerations for dealing with unharvested fruit in smoke affected vineyards. I'm also very pleased to welcome today's three guest speakers. First up, we will hear from Nick Linden, who is a livestock and industry development officer who has been working with Agriculture Victoria at Rutherglen since 2000. He has an interest in the whole lamb and beef supply chain and loves following the production cycle from genetic selection through to on-farm management and into the boning room. He has focused much of his time on feed efficiency of lambs, the profitable use of lamb finishing systems and the impacts of heat stress on lamb production. He is currently working on a number of producer demonstrations, genetics and feed base, as well as a larger project looking at the impacts of heather growth on subs growth paths on subsequent lifetime productivity. He is not from the grape industry, but has a passion for feeding animals. Suzanne McLaughlin has been a technical officer at Vine Health Australia since July 2016. She has over 20 years of experience across a range of technical viticulture and grower relations roles for commercial wine growing operations around Australia. As technical manager, Suzanne develops, implements, communicates and promotes viticultural industry biosecurity policy and practices to improve wine sector sustainability. Tony Hoare is a senior viticulturist with the AWRI industry development and support team where his main focus is viticultural extension. Tony has a wide range of viticultural experience in practical, technical and research fields. He has had various roles from vineyard hand establishing and managing vineyards, company viticulturist, grower liaison, consultant and contractor. Tony is currently researching the role of soil chemistry and wine quality through a master's program at Adelaide University and is also co-founder and co-owner of McLaren Vale based winery, cellar door and restaurant Beach Road Wines with his wine, wife, Bryony. The Q&A section, which will be held at the end of the three presentations, um, so after all the presentations, so it would be a really great idea if you could start sending in your questions as soon as they come to mind. It's a great pleasure now that I hand over to Nick Linden, who is the first of today's three speakers. Hang on, I'll just... Thanks very much, Anne, and thanks, Tony, for the invite to come and talk today's webinar. Um, yeah, and I guess as the intro said, um, grape certainly isn't my background, so I guess my approach has probably been slightly more generic to say if there's a potential feed stuff that might be available for a sheep or a beef producer to utilise, what are some of the considerations that they would um, assess that choice by um, to see if, if using grapes is going to be something that's suitable for them. So I guess the higher level outcomes are, is the feed in question, and these are the generic ones, but is the feed in question, is it actually safe? to feed to my stock and there's a couple of considerations there and toxicities. 
as well as residue levels and a couple of others which we'll come back to. And then there's a question around, well, what does the feed actually provide? Because um, essentially when we're feeding animals, it's broken down into the energy requirements, protein requirements, as well as then some fibre and down into some minerals, elements, etc. cetera. Um, I would argue nine times out of 10, probably energy is the most important item that we need to account for and budget for. So when I'm looking at either buying in supplement or bringing in a feed stuff, for my, for my animals or for the animals in general, it's energy really that we're looking to purchase. And I guess linked to that is then what sort of level of performance can we expect to achieve based on that supplement? Excuse me. Uh, no surprise. Yes. I just needed to let you know that we are having trouble seeing your slides at the moment. If you wouldn't mind just activating oh, okay. the screen. Yep, no worries. I have clicked on screen for mine and it's scrolling through. I can, I can't see the share screen slide again, sorry. Uh, let me, if I get out of that. Uh, shall I try sharing screen again, Tony? Yes, that'd be good. Sorry, folks. Yes. Uh, let's go for this one. Share. Looks Sorry, like Anne had me working. doing this beautifully. There we go. Thanks, Nick. I do apologise. Did you want to go you back to the one down to the bloke earlier up slide? Yeah. Uh, how's that, Tony? Can you see that? If you can just do full screen, please. I am on full screen. Uh, we've got the notes page showing. Uh, okay. It, well, if that's all right, we'll, we can... I can try and share a different screen, but that's possibly the easiest one just to keep going as we are, shall we? And I'll try again. Sorry. How's that, Tony? That's much better. Thank you. Sorry, folks. Um, a rookie with the technology, I'll say, but Anne had done a sensational job in bringing me up to speed, but uh, my limitation. Sorry. Um, so scrolling back through the considerations, and these are largely generic at the first level, but is the feed stuff safe? Uh, what is it actually providing in terms of energy, protein and fibre as we've talked to? And then no surprise, there's a really important consideration about price. Um, what's the price point that we can get the feed onto the farm compared to other sources of energy, which is something that we'll have a look at. And then there's some other considerations around the consistency of the supply of a new feed stuff. Just recognising that it takes particularly ruminants, but sheep and cattle, time to adapt to a new feed stuff. Um, you know, and it's really like a generic answer would be that it's going to take up to 14 days for an animal to actually adapt to the, the, the new feed or the new ingredient in a ration. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about a finishing program, it might only be 49 days that you're looking to actually feed something to a lamb or 70 days for a short fed cattle program. So... Um, how long we've got access to the feed does become a consideration. Um, and obviously you can see there's dot point there, but in emergencies, a short term high volume option may work, but more often than not, we'd be looking for a longer term supply to go over that, you know, 49 days onwards so that we can actually utilize it during a program. And lastly, I'll just put a question, a dot point question mark. I mean, can I actually handle it um, in terms of how do I, um, feed it out, am I equipped to deal with it on farm and storage feeding, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the first question around are grapes safe to feed? Um, I couldn't find any references to it being an issue from a ruminant perspective. So in terms of as a toxicology question, um, certainly nothing in the common literature or the more commonly cited sources. Um, so I thinking, you know, there's no risks from that perspective. It's pretty safe from a toxicology issue. But certainly from a vendor, you know, from a residue limit, I would be looking to receive some sort of vendor declaration as a feedstuff prior to feeding that to animals to make sure that the, the grapes weren't subject to any residue levels or withholding periods that would limit their use. Um, certainly if you didn't have access to that, you really would, 
you know, not be looking to feed it to any animals that are going for immediate slaughter and that are longer term off. So, you know, maybe breeders that are, aren't going for foreseeable slaughter would be a safer option. But certainly you would be looking for a vendor declaration to state that the grapes weren't subject to any withholding period. Now, again, my bias is very much from the livestock perspective. Um, and so safety is critical and really that transition onto the feeds if you're to start feeding grapes should be taken slowly. You know, again, for a transition onto grain, we would say it's a 14 day process of an adaptation so that the rumen in the animal, well, it's a bacteria in the rumen can actually adjust to the change in feed stuff. Um, you know, we know it's really important with grain because if you don't do it right, um, acidosis, grain poisoning, you can actually kill sheep or cattle. And I would suggest that the high sugar content in grapes, just like fodder beets, is um, really going to be risky unless you can introduce stock to it slowly. So the process for doing that would obviously be to limit their initial access to the feed stuff. Moving on, obviously we highlighted the price is really important. So how I would approach that is basically just to come up with a cost comparison. And I think I pointed out at the start that probably the most important component of the diet that we're buying in with supplements from a livestock perspective is we're bringing in energy. So to me, you know, grapes as a viable feed source would need to be comparable to the price of what I can go out and buy grain for. And I'm being a bit open-ended in this, but if we look at the common grains of barley, triticale and, and wheat, probably wheat less being fed um, to livestock, barley and trick are probably the big ticket items, but no doubt lots of wheat does get feed. If we could look at those at sort of generically to say $350 a tonne, and the, the considerations when costing a feedstuff is we need to know two things. One is the percentage of dry matter uh, and then the energy level that that feed actually has. So let's assume that for a grain, we're going to call it 90% dry matter, very little moisture in a tonne of grain uh, and the 12 units of energy per kilo of dry matter. So in terms of how I would recommend costing out a feed ration, and this is for drought feeding, supplementary feeding, any source of feeding is just to break down the cost of the supplement that we're using on a cents per megajoule basis. So how much is actually every energy of, every unit of energy that we're purchasing actually costing us? So the, the mathematics are, are pretty simple as you can see from the slide, but if we're looking at $350 for a tonne of grain, which actually provides me with 900 kilos of dry matter, because there's 10% moisture, and every kilo of that dry matter gives me 12 units of energy so the, the figures sort of blow out pretty quickly, but you'll see that it's you know just over 10,500 units of energy per purchase tonne. And at $350 a tonne, that's 35,000 cents. So just to get to that cents per unit of energy basis, you can see the cost comparison is 3.24 cents per megajoule that I can buy in when I buy in grain. So um, where, does, where would grapes need to fit from a commercial livestock feeding perspective, well, it needs to be cheaper than that 3.24 cents per unit of energy. And I've taken the liberty of having a few stabs in the dark because I was actually unable to find an actual feed test for whole grapes. So obviously there's plenty around for grape mark, but less for, for whole grapes. I've assumed them to be in the order of 10% dry matter, just recognising that, you know, they've got to have a pretty significant volume of water attached to them. Um, and and you know, that's sort of my best guess based on some fresh pasture samples and so forth. And I reckon the energy is going to be through the roof and 12 and a half megs of energy per kilo of drive matter is, is pretty much at the upper end of what we would see in any feedstuffs that we were testing. So on those same principles that we applied to the grains before, we'd be looking at you know, every tonne that you purchase is actually giving you 100 kilos of dry matter, given the 10%. And if we multiply that out by the units of energy per kilo of dry matter, you can see that for the tonne of grapes that we're getting fresh is actually providing you know, 1,250 units of energy. So if we were to provide that same price per unit of energy from grain, which was at 3.24 cents, uh, you can see it comes across to just over the 4,000 cents for a fresh tonne of grapes, which means the price point equivalent in terms of an energy basis is that I could be buying grain at $350 a tonne the equivalent price point for grapes would be $40 a tonne. That's the point that, you know, I couldn't be paying any more than that, or I may as well just go out and buy grain in terms of the energy density. So it varies a little bit across some of the other key supplements that people would be bringing into a livestock enterprise. Um, I don't need to work through those in, in detail, um, but you can see that there's barley, 
pay silage. Bailey, I've given the same costings as the previous. Um, based on slight changes in the dry matter and the energy density of hay and silage, there's a slight difference there. And you can see silage being, in this example, the most uh, expensive on a cost per unit of energy basis, which you know, the equivalence to great prices uh, lifts accordingly from that. The other point from a livestock application that I'd make is that grapes could be, without having a feed test on them, I'm sort of guessing a little bit, but I'm anticipating um, due to low chlorophyll levels and nitrogen levels associated with them that possibly they're very low in protein. So from a stock perspective, their application may be a little bit limited despite having colossal amounts of energy, but they may not be so suited uh, to either young stock or lactating stock. And if they were to be fed to those classes, they're probably going to have to have some other supplement to provide that balanced ration in the context of balancing energy and protein requirements. So the, the cost is high on a unit of energy basis, given that you're carting a lot of water, um, but taking transport out of the equation may help to a certain extent. Uh, certainly part of the discussion leading into this was, well, if people could just put the sheep into the vineyard and graze or browse them, I guess the context would be browse them directly uh, that may be a way to reduce some of the costs because certainly transporting costs aren't helping when it comes to shifting something that's only 10% dry matter. Uh, again, you can read through the points on the slide there, but there's no energy in water, so it's expensive to cart though. And in terms of a dry matter basis, if you're looking at a fixed cost to cart, you know, 24 tonnes on a truck, whatever it might be, uh, if that's grain at 90% dry matter, you've got 21 tonnes of actual dry matter versus if it's full of grapes, you've only got two and a half tonnes of actual dry matter material. So the, the, the cost um, comparison there doesn't help. Um, I, I guess Tony can speak a lot more to this than I can, but the potential downside to going and putting sheep into a vineyard directly at a time when you would be harvesting as opposed to after pruning would be the potential damage to the vines. And you know, the, the potential for reduced carbohydrate, carbohydrate stores in the vines and then the implications of that for next year would be really um, very significant. Um, and the, the cliche that we would always have around a drought or, you know, fires that we're dealing with at the moment in the recovery period is, you know, you try and limit the damage of a drought to the period when it's not raining. Um, so, you know, it might be an easy term, short term solution to go and put sheep into the vineyards now, but we could actually be compromising subsequent great growth and production for the following year, which um, needs to be accounted for. I was intrigued in searching for some images, and I should have said all these images aren't mine uh, personally, but I'll put in the presentation today, they are just generic ones that I've searched. On this one. And in the process of searching for those, I was intrigued to find this little device that was advertised online. So obviously some people are seeing a, a value to the point of having sheep in a vineyard, but I was slightly intrigued that uh, there are people out there, obviously, that have developed a muzzle that allows sheep to graze the sheep in the grass in between the, the vines, whereas without actually damaging the vines themselves, I thought that was quite intriguing. So, uh, Tony if I, and Dan, if I can just do my final slide, which is some final thoughts, very much from my bias, which is the livestock perspective. Grapes uh, appear safe to feed. There's no toxicology issues. Make sure they're not subjected to any withholding periods. Uh, but I would definitely recommend a careful induction of stock onto them. The high sugar levels could definitely lead to acidosis. You know, the feed quality, the high energy levels have high potential for animal growth off them. So it's really attractive from that perspective. But um, my position would be that there are some pretty significant limitations there. You know, if I know you, there's a different motivation potentially to actually removing the grapes from the vineyard. Um, my bias from a feeding livestock perspective is they'd need to be no more than $30 a tonne and that transport may still be prohibitive at that cost. Um, browsing of the vineyards may lead to later impacts, but maybe Tony can address that. And, and there could be some issues around handling on farm to make sure that we can feed it for a duration that's, um, that's worthwhile from a commercial perspective. And I reckon Tony or Anne, if you've got control again, that just about finishes me up. I think I just do that and then it will come up full screen, won't it? Huh.
Thanks, Nick. So today I've just been asked to discuss some of the biosecurity considerations um, for people who may, may be considering transporting smoke affected grapes. And so today, I guess a lot of the concepts I'd like to discuss really are going to be the same whether you do have smoke affected grapes or whether you are considering transporting your wine grapes um, off your property to um, another destination for processing. Um, there's a lot of requirements that have been set up which do affect um, how you can or if you can and how you can move these wine grapes around um, as well as other um, sort of items of interest I'll talk about and really um, the rules surrounding this movement is all aimed at trying to reduce the entry establishment and spread of pests diseases and weeds. So today in my talk I really want to focus on a few key areas to help you understand and get a concept of I suppose the key biosecurity considerations that you would need to be aware of and and comply with for moving not only just grapes but also um, other um, items of interest which I'll go through. So I'm just going to start by indicating a few of the key endemic pests which really do um, drive what those movement conditions are. Um, I will focus a lot on movement conditions and also mention a few other considerations which are important to mention um, when you are moving your wine grapes and that obviously might be what sort of vessels you are using um, and even um, going into harvesting of those grapes um, themselves. And then also point you in some, some directions as to where you can go for help to find out um, specific information um, for your particular movements. So in Australia, basically we have three key pests which are present in different parts of Australia and they are the pests that are actively managed to control spread uh, between the zones that have them and don't have them. There are some other pests that some states do have um, laws around the movement of, um, but I'm going to focus, um, well, purely on one of those, but there are three key pests below. And the management really of these pests not only targets the pests themselves, but also the vectors of spread of those particular pests. So how those pests can be picked up and moved. Um, and in terms of today's presentation, really for wine grapes, um, it's grape phylloxera that um, will be your most notable pest in this instance to um, take note of the movement conditions for. Um, the other two we've got here are Queensland fruit fly and Mediterranean fruit fly and perhaps those are more applicable in the table grape situation but today we're just going to focus on wine grapes. So um, grape phylloxera being present in parts of New South Wales and Victoria and um, obviously the fruit fly depending on which fruit fly. Um, we've got med fly which is present in WA and Q fly which is present in parts of Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales and the NT. But today we're going to focus on phylloxera movement which um, will, which is where your wine grapes will come into play. So in terms of considering whether you can actually move your wine grapes off your property to um, your processing destination, whatever that may be. Um, you need to consider where you're located and where you're located will be in a particular phylloxera management zone. Australia is divided into three different phylloxera management zones. So we have a phylloxera infested zone where we know phylloxera either has been historically or is currently found. There's a phylloxera risk zone, which is an area of which we don't know what the status is. So it hasn't been um, observed there, but we actually haven't looked. And a phylloxera exclusion zone where we know the um, insect is not. And movement between those three zones is tightly regulated through laws. Um, and they're particular laws that focus on the movement of what we call phylloxera risk vectors. So those are items that can pick up and spread the pest. So grapes, in terms of wine grapes and table grapes, um, the, the movement of which is, is regulated. Um, and there's also other movement conditions which relate to grape related products. So for example, um, grape juice, uh, must, grape mark, wine, etc. Uh, machinery and equipment and vehicles used in the production of grapes is also regulated, um, as is the movement of planting material and even diagnostic samples and vineyard soils. 
And not to forget that even though um, the movement of people is not regulated uh, through state um, quarantine standards, um, it is really important to bear in mind um, farm gate hygiene in terms of the movement of people uh, for their footwear and clothing, because um, these are two items that can pick up and spread phylloxera as well and do need to be managed on site. If you do need to find another map, uh, this is only an excerpt of the map of the phylloxera management zones in Australia, we do have a map on our website which you can go to at that link. Um, okay, so as I was saying, the movement conditions for these phylloxera risk vectors are managed by state biosecurity departments in their um, documents called plant quarantine standards or they might be referred to as a plant quarantine manual or even a different name. Um, and basically they list a whole lot of pests which are regulated for a particular state um, and the movement vectors which can pick up and spread those pests. Now with regards to movement of wine grapes, um, we do have differing movement conditions between different states. So it's not a good assumption to, um, to make if you do know the quarantine standards quite well for say your own state that you're in um, to then presume that they're going to be the same for sending something to into a different state. Um, the rules do differ and so it's very important that you do consider uh, the quarantine requirements for entry into the destination state where you are um, trying to move your product. If, of course, you're trying to move it interstate. If you're moving it within a state and your state has multiple phylloxera management zones, there will be movement requirements within your state that you do need to be aware of. So in terms of these regulated movement conditions, generally they are written in the form of either a prohibition where it will say, um, for example, um, wine grapes moving from a phylloxera infested zone into say a phylloxera exclusion zone are prohibited. So basically that means you can't do it. Um, on the other side we have allowable movements which in most cases come with conditions. So what that means is there's a range of things which you may or may not need to do just depending on the type of item that you're moving. Now, some of these are related to the movement of wine grapes and some of these are just broader, which do relate to the movement of might be machinery and equipment um, that might be have been used in vineyards um, or other items. But I just thought I'd go through the range of um, aspects which you will need to consider um, even in the future if you are moving other um, sort of vineyard or winery related items um, from your property. So generally we say that the movement of items, for example, like machinery and equipment, um, definitely need to be clean of soil and plant material. And that obviously reduces the chance that you're going to be moving, say, an insect that might be caught in soil fragments on, say, a machine. Sometimes those machine um, machines or equipment may actually need to be treated using a specific method which will be attributed to that specific type of machinery or equipment. And options for those generally include things like hot water treatment or dry heat treatment or say filtration or even sterilization with a chemical. Um, consigned to prevent spillage. So this is a really re relevant one to moving wine grapes. Obviously to ensure that you're not spilling the contents of your grape bins or trucks. You do need to make sure that you are filling your bins or your trucks um, within a certain level from the top lip, which happens to be 200 millimetres. And this will prevent, uh, hopefully in most cases, um, any spillage out of those bins or trucks. Um, that's important if you do have a particular pest, say inside that load, um, we don't want it spilling onto roads and potentially being able to um, get close to other vines along the way. Sometimes you will be asked to move your load according to an approved route of travel. So that um, is often if you are under a particular accreditation system, um, this aspect may be part of that where you need to actually list which route your um, carrier will use, for example, to get from your property to the end destination. And generally we say if you are moving something out of a phylloxera exclusion zone, um, it's best not to travel through a phylloxera infested zone or a phylloxera risk zone if that can be helped. Um, spillage management plans, once again, is 
um, part of if you are moving wine grapes under an accreditation scheme, um, having a spillage management plan that you've discussed with your carrier is um, a really important thing. And that um, is something that you may need to address down the, down the track. Um, carriers often do carry spillage management kits with them. Um, but once again, that will be detailed um, according to an accreditation system you, you may end up being under if you are moving wine grapes. Biosecurity documentation. Um, now that can be quite broad. Um, there's quite a few different documents which you may uh, be required to carry. But these do vary depending on where you're moving from, where you're moving to and what the particular item is that you're moving. Sometimes it might be a document to prove um, to, as a proof document, um, proof of origin of where you have grown your grapes, for example. It might be to prove that you've under, undergone a certain um, treatment. Um, it might be a permit, for example, to move a zone if you're moving out of a quarantine zone. Um, moving into some states, particularly those states that are phylloxera exclusion zones as the whole states, do require you to register as an importer or to notify that you are going to make an import prior to doing that. So that's something to bear in mind. And some of these states as well also require you to have your load inspected on arrival. Now sometimes that can be done um, at the destina destination of where you're sending your um, your load, but sometimes it will need to be done by the state biosecurity department um, that, of, of the destination state. So these are just, um, I guess, considerations that you need to be aware of that may apply in your situation. Um, very quickly here is just a bit of a diagram to show you that generally um, in terms of phylloxera, um, you can move from what we call sort of a clean to a dirty state quite easily. So if you were moving your wine grapes, for example, from a phylloxera exclusion zone, you can do that to a phylloxera risk zone or a phylloxera infested zone um, quite easily. But it's when you're actually coming out of a quarantine zone, um, that's where restrictions do apply, um, obviously to minimize the spread of that particular pest out of that zone. So generally you cannot move items out of a phylloxera or wine grapes anyway, out of a phylloxera infested zone to a phylloxera risk zone. And you can't do that to a, from a phylloxera infested zone to an exclusion zone. Um, there are some cases where you can move um, wine grapes out of a phylloxera risk zone to a phylloxera exclusion zone, however, but you need to consult um, your destination winery, uh, your destination state, um, sorry, for those specific requirements. So just thinking a little bit more about some other considerations which you may need to make. Um, if you are considering moving your wine grapes off your property that have been smoke affected, um, there's a few things. So harvester hygiene is, is really important. So um, obviously, in a normal situation even, um, in a normal year where you may have had pest and disease problems in a particular block, um, the best thing would be to do, if you can, would be to harvest your clean blocks first and then go into um, you know, a, a block where you might have had a particular pest problem. In terms of minimising the likelihood that that pest is now going to be on the inside of your harvester and picked up and spread into a, you know, a clean block. And the same could go for smoke affected grapes where you could actually end up picking up, you know, grape matter from one block to another if you are moving from, you know, a non smoke affected block into a smoke affected block. And really that what that comes down to though is um, the effectiveness of harvester wash down or actually considering doing that in between different blocks of different status. So maybe of different pest and disease status and also obviously between vineyards that you may have. So it's best if you can wash down between blocks. Um, if that is not possible, um, you do need to, I guess, understand the risk that you could be moving pests or even, you know, smoke affected grapes from, from, a, um, from one block to another. But generally, if you can pick in the order of um, sort of clean to dirty, if that makes sense, if, if that is a possibility, um, that would be best practice. Now, just um, a couple of quick things, if you are, obviously moving those wine grapes either through a bulk truck or, or um, in a bin. It's really important that you ensure that any bins or trucks arriving to your site to collect that load are clean of soil and plant material when they arrive. Um, and even, you know, if you are using contractors to do this, to make sure that the contractors arrive clean to your vineyard as well. And this is all about minimizing the spread of pests and diseases and weeds onto your vineyard. 
Um, we do recommend that any bin loading, for example, is underdone, is undertaken on hard stand areas away from vine rows. And once again, that just minimises the, um, you know, the pickup of um, soil on those um, those tyres and, and potential spread that way. Um, it's important to know where those bins or the trucks have been before they come onto your bin yard. So if you can ask that no machinery or equipment comes onto your site that's been working, um, for example, in a phylloxera infested zone or a phylloxera risk zone in the last 21 days, if you are in a phylloxera exclusion zone, that will minimise your um, chances of that pest spread out of that quarantine zone. And the reason we say that is that phylloxera can last for 21 days um, without food. So that just tries to minimise um, yeah, the pickup and spread of that pest. Bearing in mind that um, moving machinery and equipment out of a phylloxera infested zone does require sterilisation, but it's just another, um, I guess, safeguard, particularly in times of harvest where, you know, there's a lot of activity and, and um, a lot of movement between vineyards and, you know, the propensity for um, perhaps not cleaning um, equipment as, as thoroughly as you possibly could. Um, another thing just to remember is the movement of people around your property as well. If you are getting drivers or contractors coming to your vineyard, um, don't forget the footwear and clothing aspect as well. Um, if you can keep you know, them out of your vineyard as much as possible and just restricted to um, hard pack areas um, or you know, office areas while they're waiting to load, um, that's also best practice. So just to wrap up here, um, Many of you may be considering, right, I want to move wine grapes from a particular area um, to your destination, which may or may not be a winery. Um, to know those particular movement requirements, I would suggest that you consult your sending state biosecurity department, but you can either access, you can access um, the plant quarantine standards, for example, by clicking on vinehealth.com.au forward regulation for um, slash movement regulations. That is a web page we have where you can link to each state's um, pl uh, plant quarantine standards or equivalent um, and the phone numbers to each state to talk to those biosecurity officers about um, helping you um, understand and meet those um, movement requirements. When you are talking to the plant standards officers, um, it's good to have some idea um, of obviously where, well, obviously your location, but where you want to move that uh, material to and what material that is. So obviously in this case, it may be wine grapes, but tomorrow it could be, who knows, um, you know, could be planting material, it could be something else. So obviously knowing um, the type of material you're moving is really important um, when you want to do that movement, um, the quantity that you want to move and the number of consignments. So here we're talking about, you know, are you just moving 20 tonnes of wine grapes or are you moving, you know, 320 tonnes of wine grapes over X number of loads? Some of those questions may then affect whether you are operating sort of as a once-off move or whether you may consider um, a sort of a self-accreditation system, if you like, to um, mean that you have the onus to ensure that you're meeting the biosecurity um, movement requirements as opposed to necessarily um, taking on um, a biosecurity officer from the sending state to come and approve your loads before they go. Um, here on the screen, I've just got a few key contacts. Now they're just for South Australia and um, Victoria and New South Wales, but obviously um, that website I said before um, will have contacts for the other states as well. So the contacts on your screen are key biosecurity officers who talk to the um, viticulture industries and they are there to answer your questions about which specific movement requirements um, are relevant to you for the movements you want to do. Thank you.
Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, thank you also to Nick for his talk earlier. Thank you uh, for joining us for the webinar today. And uh, as a panelist um, today, I'm, I'll be talking about managing smoke affected vineyards where fruit is not harvested for winemaking. I'll be addressing some questions um, which have been asked by industry um, in recent times. We know that unharvested wine grapes um, due to smoke taint can cause problems for the following season and that raises some issues. Um, besides being unsightly and being an attractant of vinegar flies, what are some considerations with managing a vineyard with an unharvested crop? How does that unharvested crop influence the following season's crop? What are the options of removing the crop cost effectively? And why is the timing of fruit removal important? Leaving a crop unharvested um, can introduce um, problems with fungi, um, which colonize um, the vine um, and feed off sugars and amino acids from the leaking berries. The inoculum, which is produced um, by these fungi, um, can overwinter and on canes and in leaf litter, and then present um, increased disease pressure for the following season, and especially with, uh, in the case of botrytis. So removing unharvested fruit before disease occurs reduces the risk of infecting canes, spurs and leaves with fungal pathogens. There is a cost associated with removing that fruit, but this can be offset uh, the following season by not having the, to use additional controls for disease management and avoid losing um, income through potential winery downgrades from diseased fruit. Canopy management is an important consideration with unharvested fruit. Um, Post-harvest vine care has a great influence on bud burst, vine growth and yield for the following season. It's important to maintain a healthy canopy uh, through adequate soil moisture using post-harvest nutrition uh, to avoid defoliation. Avoiding leaf loss from diseases such as downy mildew and insect damage is also very important and uh, this can be done through maintaining control, a control program until leaf fall. It is also important to avoid diseases such as powdery mildew, which um, will manifest themselves late season and without control. Um, and they can, uh, manifest, they can cause problems in the following season um, through um, increased inoculum. I have a link to a fact sheet here on post-harvest care of grapevines, um, uh, which I recommend you have a look at. And this has a, a, a full, um, full list of instructions on how to look after vines um, post-harvest. There's also an increased cost of pruning with unharvested um, vines. Unharvested bunches, slow pre-pruning machinery and hand pruning. Barrel pruners and cutter bars become clogged as sticky unharvested bunches. Speeds for these machines can also be slowed, which results in increased cost to the grower. Mechanical pre-pruning um, does not remove the majority of bunches as they sit below the cutting zone. And these then add to the cost um, of hand pruning, having to remove those remnant bunches. Pruners are also slowed because they have to remove those bunches with additional cuts. Uh, they sometimes have trouble seeing where to make the cuts because of the bunches. And they also have problems with uh, pruning equipment being clogged up by, by sugary remnants of grapes. I've done a, a quick cost analysis um, after speaking to some industry um, contractors. And it is, it's estimated that the additional cost of pruning an unharvested vineyard is between five and 10 cents per vine which in a typical vineyard density of three by two meter spacings will result in $167 extra um, per hectare. This equates to up to a 20% increase in pruning costs. There is an option of um, harvesting fruit um, and I um, have looked into um, the, the process of distillation. Smoke tainted grapes can be used for spirit production the process of distillation of wine made from smoke tainted fruit does separate glycosides, um, smoke taint 
uh, caused by smoke taint from the spirit. Remaining volatiles can then also be removed by carbon fining, um, which can be optional by the distiller, um, who may prefer to have some of those volatiles in there. So in general, um, unfortunately, small distilleries uh, lack the equipment to process grapes to wine, and this can make it cost prohibitive for smaller distilleries to um, buy fruit and um, for growers to recover costs of harvesting. There is a company in Nui, Upta in South Australia, um, Tarek Technologies, and they are offering to purchase grapes and wine for distillation. And I've done a cost analysis um, looking at um, how that may offset harvest costs. And based on typical harv harvesting costs of $975 per hectare, um, all inclusive, um, and freight at a, an estimated price of $30 per tonne, um, when they are compared to um, the, the revenue of $110 per tonne for grapes for distillation, if you have a yield of 12 tonnes per hectare, then you can offset 100% of harvesting and freight costs. If you take into account the additional costs at pruning of leaving um, fruit unharvested, which was $167 per hectare, you can reduce that yield down to 10 tonnes per hectare to recover all the harvesting and freight costs. I'll let you utilise those um, parameters with your own um, costings. Um, it is important to understand that obviously if you're looking at harvesting fruit for distillation, that um, all the costs add up so that you're not um, losing money in the process. I've outlined here the terms and conditions um, for Tarek Technologies. I'll let you go through them. Um, there's grape supply at $110 a tonne, and then there's also um, the offer of um, purchasing wine at seven cents per litre, which does um, allow people um, interstate the option of potentially delivering um, fruit that has been processed into wine. Uh, the contact is Greg Jackson and Greg's details are, are listed below here. Grapes can also be harvested into the mid row under vine um, onto the ground. Um, this is a um, process that normally happens quite quickly with the harvester, so the cost of harvesting can be reduced to as little as $100 um, per hour to do this. Um, this is still a cost to the grower, so um, if you can actually have the fruit um, sold for distillate, um, then that can offset those costs, um, as I showed in the previous slide. Um, grapes um, can be harvested um, onto the ground, as I mentioned, which then makes it a bit easier for livestock to graze that fruit on the ground rather than trying to um, find the fruit through canes and leaves. Grapes will also um, be quite um, handy as far as adding organic matter to the soil and will decompose and be incorporated into the soil over time. Uh, to increase the rate of decomposition, uh, cultivation of the mid-row and undervine areas, um, mixing with soil, or covering with straw, composted or green mulch can increase that decomposition time. There are some considerations with the timing of um, removing fruit with a machine harvester. Um, harvest ready wine grapes, so wine grapes you would normally pick um, at a, a level of ripeness for a winery, are generally the easiest to harvest from vines. Harvesting at minimal berry shrivel will maximise the speed of a machine harvester to capture the maximum amount of yield and be the most cost effective. Overripe fruit and shriveled fruit, especially fruit infected with botrytis, can have weakened attachment to the bunch stalks and can drop in front of the machine harvester and may not be collected by the harvester. Dehydrated or raisin fruit um, can require a slower harvester speed to harvest fruit, which can lead to potential damage to canes and increased defoliation through faster beta rod speeds. Vineyards with autumnal foliage or severely defoliated vines can also predispose canes and dormant buds to damage from machine harvester beta rods. Fruit in this condition can also be lost through the harvester fans and due to, loss, uh, due to low um, juice extraction rates and high levels of ripeness, it is unlikely to be useful for distillation. So the take home message here is the decision to harvest should be made earlier rather than later. 
there are some really good resources available. Um, your regional associations are a great place to start. Um, and I know that regions in smoke affected um, areas have been um, very quick to um, adopt a lot of the resources that are available to industry and are a great um, place to start. Additionally to that, the AWRI has um, provided a lot of information on um, smoke tainted vineyards and dealing with uh, smoke affected vineyards. A uh, fact sheet was, which I have here has recently been released. If you click on the, on the red tag on the homepage, the AWRI, that will take you through to a um, dedicated smoke and bushfire page with lots of links to, to good information. Wine Australia also have many good links um, to information and I've provided a link to their website here. I'd just like to acknowledge um, some contributors for today's presentation. Um, ben Pridham for his information, particularly about pruning and harvesting. Alistair Sando as well with uh, pruning and harvesting. Um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Bruna Holzafel from CSU um, with his information on carbohydrates in vines. Greg Jackson from Tarek Technologies. Um, Dr. Paul Petri, Matt Holstock, Marcel Essling, and Mark, Dr. Mark Christick from the AWRI. And special thanks to Nick Linden and Suzanne uh, McLaughlin and Anne Lord for helping put this webinar together today. Thank you for your attendance. And we will go into um, taking some questions now. So I'll repeat the questions as they come through, if you'd like to send any questions through and we'll direct them to the various speakers. So we're just waiting for questions to come through at the moment. We don't seem to be having any questions coming through at this stage. If you do wish to ask questions at a later date, oh, hang on, here's our first question. Now they're coming through. The first question is, is there active research in removing smoke taint or is it impossible? I'll have to pass that question on to the commercial services and winemaking um, department and we'll answer that question um, get back directly to you Alison second question is are there any distillate receivers in New South Wales which are known uh, we don't know at this stage but there must be some commercial facilities potentially available and um, it's probably best to ask through the regional association if they may be able to locate somebody and assist there, Rory. We might finish up there. I'll um, pass it back to Anne. Um, she just has one final comment. And if there are any questions you would like to ask, please don't hesitate to contact the help desk at the AWRI at any stage. Thanks for your attendance today.
I'd like to extend a thank you to Nick, Suzanne and Tony for providing today's audience some key information in dealing with this challenging situation. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for participating in today's session. All attendees, as, a, all, as attendees, you will all receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. Please keep an eye out for notifications of de details of upcoming AWRI webinars, which are currently being planned. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.